Welcome to Supporting Families in the iWorld, a workshop for parents, teachers, mentors, and people who like kids, people who like or love or loathe screens. I will be your cruise director today. My name is Sarah Thomas. I am the K-8 Technology Coordinator at Norwood School, just over the bridge in Bethesda, Maryland, and I work with teachers and students and parents to integrate technology into their classrooms and to build healthy digital lives. And in 20 days, I will be moving to the state of Alabama to become a middle school principal. So um, to work with the craziest population known to man, the middle school child. So I'm very excited. Hmm? I'm moving to the Montgomery Academy in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, so I'm really excited to be here with you today. We'll be talking in circles a lot. Um, I'll give some data for people who really like data. I'll give some anecdotes for people who like stories. Um, and then we'll share some practical strategies, strategies too that you as parents or you as youth leaders or you as whatever it is you do to work with students can, um, can do to help them make good choices and, and live in this crazy digital world we live in. I spend a lot of my time with 5 to 14-year-olds, uh, so that's my frame of reference. So when I tell my stories, they typically have to do with middle school kids um, because that's kind of the a big entry point for building an online life. So we'll talk about that today. And then we will tackle, you know, what are some practical applications for actually using digital tools for formation because I think that's a really important um, thing too just so that, that you can use it for good, not evil. Um, so we're going to skip this part as an e-poll just because we're a small group. So if, if you wouldn't mind, just tell me you know, who you are and what brought you to this particular place today. Oh, we have 25 people online. <gasps> oh my god. So I lied. Go quickly, please. So now I have to open it on my phone. I'm not just texting, I promise. Um, where did I put it? Social. So if you would just let me know where, why are you, or who you are, and then we'll talk with the people in the room more specifically, other than just what you, what you do. Um, it's called Poll Everywhere, and so this poll right here, um, I can see the real-time results on my phone. Gosh, I love technology. Only pick one. Pick the best answer. I know that's hard, because I'm other, so other works, yeah. There's just one question. Yep, I'm just asking you a general idea. Yep. So with non-ordained formation leader, I gave more specifics in Sunday school and youth leader, but if neither of those works, then other is fine. And I didn't say, other than I'm a teacher, I'm also a parishioner at St. John's um, in Norwood in Bethesda. So cradle, lover of the Episcopal Church. Wow. So um, I'll tell you, because it's hard. It, that way I don't have to flip back and forth. But um, so right now we have two Sunday school teachers, one from each division, five youth leaders, eight ordained formation leaders, two parents, and four others um, that have filled out the poll. So thank you so much. For the people in the room, um, and if, is there a chat window in the webinar? if they want to offer over chat as well. Um, other than being these, these roles, what brought you to this particular room today? What are you hoping to get out of this?
I'm interested in everything that you have to offer. Um, I also actually have a digital formation program, an online formation program, and some parents are resistant, and so I'm looking for strategies to encourage their participation. Okay, awesome. You want to pass that around, pass the mic around? We have a communication volunteer as well as hoping to help with youth, uh, Sunday school teacher, parent communications volunteers, uh, pastor, overall spiritual formation of all ages, and non-ordained formation leaders. This is something that the parents, so I work with pre-K to through high school as their priest, and parents have already asked me, like, what guidance do I have? And my guidance is, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, like, besides sit with your kid and teach them how to be safe, and I don't even know what safe means. Right. My safe started with, like, wash your hands before you use the computer because this is a special technology. <laughs> but I've been... I've been on the internet since I was four, right. so it's a different yep. Yep. kind of. Anyone else want to just share what brought you here today? I am going to be assistant rector at a new parish, and I'm going to have oversight of youth and family ministries, but I'm also the parent of two children who are on the internet all the time. <laughs> and so... Um, yeah, I'm just now, they're just now starting to get into that looking up something on YouTube and accidentally stumbling upon something that I may or may not want them to see. Yes. So. All right. Awesome. Then one more, looking for information that I can share with youth leaders. Awesome. Okay, great. Okay, we're all on the same page. We're all in this together. So basically I want to start with kind of, you know, thinking about um, why, why it is that we want our children to have um, the values and the messages that we're giving them now. So keeping this in the back of our heads, keeping this proverb back in the back of our heads. So we've got two worlds. We have the digital world, which has one set of values, and we have our home and community worlds, with ha which have an entire different set of values, and they don't play well with others. So um, the digital world, the companies that run the internets, um, the people that build apps, the people that are doing things that for, for consumption for children, they are not taking into account the developmental stage of the children. They're not taking into account that these are individual humans who are going through lots of different phases of life. They're interested in them as data points, as numbers. They, are, they want to make change as fast as possible so that the next cool new thing can be bought by lots of sweet little faces. They also they target youth in their products, in their product development, because youth are fearless about exploring on the internet. So knowing all those things about the digital world's values, how does that clash with ours? Um, we recognize and we think carefully about, about what we put in front of our children in terms of technology. We recognize that we have shared values of kindness and compassion and learning that we want them to gain from their use of, of these tools. We also recognize that they're individual people and that they're all going to have different experiences with what they're going to find online. We want to honor their developmental stages, recognizing that a three-year-old's experience is, that, is very different than that of even a five-year-old and that we want to guide them to their own learning process so that when they, when they make not their mistakes on the internet, which they will, that we guide them as learning processes, not as punishments. So that's kind of where I start from. With that said, I do not think internet companies are all evil and bad. I think there's important things that, that we can use and harness technology for very, very good things. So I'm going to share a little bit of that too. So here's just kind of an overview of what we're going to look at today. Some numbers, two slides and then I'm done with numbers, I promise. But I think it's really important that you get some data behind kids and um, parents and adults. Um, we'll talk about the digital footprint, why it matters. We'll talk about the adolescent brain because that's really where uh, uh, our problems or our difficulties that we start to see with, with kids involving in media start to occur is it's during the adolescence and there's a really clear reason why and it's the brain. Um, we're going to talk about good traits and habits of a digital family and digital communities and then we will also um, talk about some considerations, some practical applications that you can do within your formation um, programs within your churches and communities. So just some numbers. Here's some numbers about kids. 
Okay, and actually, this whole slide changed after Randall posted um, a new Pew research on the eFormation Facebook the other day. I was like, whoa, those, that data blows my mind, and it's totally different than what I had. So I'm glad it was posted. So 56% of teenagers 13 to 17 go online multiple times a day. And 91% of them do that using mobile devices, iPhones, iPads, whatever you might have, at least occasionally during the day. 95% of teenagers have access to the internet every single day, maybe not in their pocket, but certainly at their school or their local library. And 81% of teens use social networking. So those are just some interesting numbers that have to deal with the saturation of media use. Um, interesting from that same study was that girls tend to use the visually oriented programs, Instagram, Snapchat, more than boys. That's actually not that surprising, but it's, um, it, it is what it is. And that boys tend to dominate console gameplay. Um, though I have a lot of girl gamers at my school that would totally fight me on that one, but the research will say, will say that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, teens are kids to me. Yeah. Yeah, it also comes, I'm talking generally, these are data about t um, teens. I call kids kids until they're 18. Um, and also there's that same, yeah, that same difficulty occurs with young adults. Is a young adult a college kid or is a young adult me? I know. So, yeah, so clarifying that, yes, thank you. Um, the, I thought it was very interesting that um, higher socioeconomic brackets tend to use more of the image-based pro. Um, Programs, Snapchat, Instagram, that kind of thing. I just thought that was an interesting thing because the children I teach are in a higher socioeconomic bracket and are certainly um, on Instagram anytime they can be. They're allowed to be. Um, the average teenager sends 30 or more texts per day, um, and that doesn't include the group text, which is all the rage with my 10 and 11 year olds right now, of no in, um, intellectual merit in the, hi, hi, how are you, how are you? Emoji, emoji, emoji. So, but that the texting is the primary um, communication method for our adolescents. So that's kind of what our teenagers are doing. And the reason I don't have data on um, younger children in social media is because of the law that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But um, let's talk about our parents for a second, or the adults, um, and something that I thought was really interesting. This data comes from the Family Online Safety Institute, which is a great, great resource for research, for data, for parent education. Um, and they are international, so there's it's really interesting sometimes when you want to nerd out to compare the data between the US and Europe. It's it's kind of fun, and they have a great conference every fall here in D.C. So 64% of parents say they're confident about tracking their child's technology. But when you split that out amongst young children and teenagers, it's 73% for um, young children, they parents feel confident, and 58% for teenagers. So, so as the, the children become more autonomous in their tech use, parents become a little bit more confident. Um, that 81% or 61% of parents think that they know more about technology and being online than their kids. Um, I hope you always do as adults know more than your kid, than more than the children in the room. But again, that really is disparate. So 80% of that is parents with young children and 36 is that of parents of teens. So time to turn that tide on those little teenagers. 41% of parents say they monitor their child's tech use. Um, 42% of parents think that the benefits to technology and the detriments or the harms are equal. I'd love to see that balance shifted as well for them to see more of the good in what technology can do for their children. Um, but 93% nine, of their parents believe, believe that their child is safe online. Um, I think that is a very fascinating overblown number. So why do these numbers matter? Well. There's my favorite thing called the digital footprint. And so stepping away from our children for a minute and thinking about ourselves, I just want you to take about 30 seconds to think about how many online accounts you have for yourself, anywhere you sign in with a username and password. And then step away from the mic. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Anyone want to share their share a number, a ballpark? 20? Okay, 20? 20 to 30? I know for me, just for work, just for work. So I'm in ed tech, so I have 800 accounts for like every tool known to, not 800, not really. That was an exaggeration, but I have a billion zillion accounts. That makes the exaggeration seem more realistic um, for all these ed tech things. So just that is over 20 plus all of my own social media and shopping and this, that, and the other. So that's our, our, our footprint that we are creating as adults with a fully formed brain. So imagine for a second how many our children might have and the decisions and the potentials that can be done with a non-fully formed brain, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the other piece is what would happen, this is just theoretical or you know, an out there question about what would happen if a part of your digital life disappeared? And how would that feel? And what would that do to you as a, as a person? Um, I'll give you a quick little personal story that just happened last week. And my fiance passed away in October. And um, last week, I went to my Facebook page. And it said I was no longer engaged to him. It just said engaged. And I was like, what the what? And I went to Facebook, and his page had been deactivated. And that was, of course, traumatic in this sense of photos and videos and all of this life that had been built online was suddenly gone. Happiness of the story, several Facebook emails back and forth, it's been fixed. But it was this traumatic moment of, oh my gosh, this is online. So I, and it's gone. And so what that feels like for our children who have started to build their digital lives early and earlier and earlier. Um, and that becomes the place for their, all of their photos and all of their videos and all of their conversations and all of their contacts. And so thinking about, within that digital footprint, um, those parts to consider as well. Okay. Um, so why does this matter? We've got two parts. The boring part, but the important part, is the COPA and data. So the reason that it matters about the digital footprint is that children uh, are not legally allowed to have social media accounts before the age of 13. You've probably checked the box more times than you realize that says, I am older than 13, click. This, this law, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, is generally meant to protect companies. It's meant to protect companies from collecting the data because if they collect data on people under 13, they're liable, which is why they make you check the box. When you check the box and, and you're not telling the truth, as many of my children have, oh, I'm 13, but I'm actually 11, it starts to have implications on both what's being collected on, on you in terms of data, and I'll talk about what's actually being collected in a moment, but also in a lot of ways, these um, should our children make poor choices that might have legal ramifications if they've said they're 13 when they're 10, it is going to think they are 18 before they are 18. And if they've made poor choices, it can come back to haunt them in ways that they can't even comprehend. So that's something to be um, mindful of. Also, I don't know what it is on every site, but on Facebook, for example, if you say you're 18, or if you say you're 13, it's going to track your age, and you can't go back and change your age. You can deactivate your account and start a new one, but that particular age can never be reverted. So that's just an interesting piece. So what is this data that's being collected on us? Um, ooh, my beautiful slide has disappeared. So I'll tell you what beautiful picture is normally on that slide. That's weird. It was in the last one. But anyway, so there's five kinds of data that's being collected on you. The service data is the data that gives you your name and your social security card and credit card number, the stuff that you put in that you have to have to sign up for an account. Service data, stuff you tell the computer, okay? You've made that choice. Then there's the disclosed data. That's also stuff that you put on, blog posts, photographs, status updates, comments, messages, and stuff. Stuff that you willingly put out there, okay? Then we start to get go down this continuum of creepy 
um, because then there's the next piece is entrusted data, which is the type of data that is that's post on other people's pages of social networking. When you are tagged, when you are um, when you are making comments on another person's uh, page or you're tweeting to another person, those are those are that's also being collected under your name. Um, when people post things about you, that's also being collected. That's called the incidental data. And that's also being collected as well. And then the creepiest part of the data is the behavioral data. And this is the piece I share with kids, is that everything you click and everything you look for and search for is recorded and therefore kept, um, allows companies to then market you and market your name and this data is bought and sold. So the example I tell my kids, um, and it actually happened in teaching a class. I was teaching a sixth grade class. We were working on, on researching history for social studies class. And so we went to the history channel. And um, we were looking up Martin Luther, I think. And we were, we were talking about how it's really important if you're looking for Martin Luther King, it is not the same as Martin Luther and how we need to be mindful. Um, reminding a sixth grader that's kind of important. And But what the interesting piece of this lesson was, here we are searching on the History Channel, and all of a sudden a pair of pants that I had searched for on Ann Taylor on my home computer the day before were in the ad section. So we start talking to kids about ads on websites really, really early, like second grade, just so they know. Don't click on that because it's a commercial. Um, but this was targeted specifically to my preferences and my information and my data. And I said, I was at my home computer searching for this, and here I am on my school computer, and here it is. And so helping them see that that kind of data is, is bought and sold and it follows us everywhere we go. It's not, in, it's not oh, tremendously harmful. We, at some point in the digital world, need to kind of understand that we're going to be little teensy bits of us owned by Google, owned by Facebook, owned by something. Because that kind of data is kind of the admission for play, so to speak. But it's helpful for kids to know this so that they are mindful of what's happening out there. The second part of why our digital footprint matters, oh, where are all my pictures? Let me try. There they are. Yay! It's a Christmas miracle. Okay, so the the why does it matter part two is has specifically to deal with the children themselves. So talking about their brain, talking about the perceptions and realities they face as kids in the digital age, and then um, talking a little bit about their identity development. That's the next three parts we're going to kind of look at. So you're probably familiar them with the adolescent brain and the fact that the prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain, where that blue arrow is pointing to, is the part of our brain that's responsible for self-control, for decision making. And this piece of the brain isn't done um, building itself until you're about 25. Sometimes older, sometimes younger. It typically um, takes longer in, in males than females. Um, and it's just kind of the way it is. That's the way the brain development works. And the tricky part about this is our kids are starting to explore a digital life um, where with endless opportunities and choices before their brain is fully functioned. And so this can open up both amazing opportunities and portals for com connection and communication and building relationships, but can also be a slippery slope into bad choices. So one of the things that I often do is talk specifically to the kids about this process, about your brain is going to fight you. I don't bore them with too much research. I don't bore them with scary or try to scare them with stories about stranger danger because they don't care. And also a lot of the um, abduction and stranger pieces that we've always said are true are actually really not. So we um, we really talk to them about your brain's going to fight you on making good choices. So how can you fight back? So we do that a little bit about with the brain. Tech is everywhere. It's a little story about this picture. This is actually my family. Um, it's my sister and her husband and my cousin. And we were visiting, we were just on vacation a couple weeks ago, and I looked up from my own phone and the couch and saw this happening. You know, everyone on their own little device. And I'm sure you've seen this in restaurants, and you've seen this 
in the car these days, and you've seen it probably maybe in your own home or in your own church. And this has kind of become the new reality for a lot of families and a lot of people. Um, and the trick is, how do we harness the eight hours a day that the average 10-year-old spends with media um, and, and use it for good? Okay, so teenagers, upwards of 11 and 12 hours per day on media, that's TV, that's internet, that's phone, that's anything with a screen. Um, and how do we, how is it changing the way that we connect? Um, well, I, did a pre I do a presentation every year to the sixth graders at a school in Baltimore, and one of the girls last year said, oh, she whispered in her small group, but the internet can be so good. And I was like, I'm doing too much mean. And so I focused, I really refocused on, yes, we can connect with people across the globe. And we can um, communicate in real time, face to face, like this right now. And that's amazing. And so how are we harnessing that for good? Also, how when students, um, when kids are interacting with media, are they actually also interacting with each other? Um, in our school, before school, our kids are allowed to be on their laptops in the common room just relaxing before we start chapel. And um, it's really fascinating because some teachers really don't like it. I don't, I don't like that they are all on their screens. But if you really look at it, they're talking to one another. They're talking about last night's sports scores. They're playing games where they're playing simultaneously. They're searching for questions that for answers to questions they have together. So it is a something that while this perception can be seen a lot, we want to avoid this passive piece to the oversaturation of media, but we also want to recognize that there are things for good. And then another perception I think is really a perception I think is really interesting is how the children perceive us. So if my niece, who's 12, were to walk into this room, I think she would probably be like, hello, is anyone here? And that's true. Highlights Magazine, which has been around for a bazillion years and was in my doctor's office when I was a little girl, um, puts out a state of the kid um, at, uh, issue every fall. And this year's state of the kid talked a lot about how kids feel about their parents and the adults in their lives and their phones. And kids feel like their parents are more attached to their phones than them. They feel like they want more family time and one-on-one -on -one time that is unplugged. And these were school-aged children, so five to, five to 18. And that kids want parents to use the media with them. OK, I'm playing a video game. Come play my video game with me. Understand why I care about this. Now that piece shifts a little bit the older the t children get. Teenagers know they still don't want you in their stuff. But it's, it's something that's really important. Uh, you'll hear me talk about modeling a lot. And I think this is a really important piece to, to be mindful of, is that, that modeling of the way that we expect uh, kids and families to behave online. And then the last piece of consideration about using media and the digital footprint is to talk a little bit about how kids are changing. Um, this fabulous book came out, I want to say, two summers ago now by Howard Gardner and Katie Davis. Howard Gardner is the father of multiple intelligence theory. They're both out. Katie was his research um, fellow at Harvard. and they wrote this incredible book about how children have changed um, in the app generation. I like to call them the I generation. But this, this group of, of, of ways that they have changed. And they talk specifically about identity, intimacy, and imagination. Um, there are a lot of questions more than specific answers. But how the question I ask teenagers a lot or middle schoolers a lot is, how does your online life reflect your offline life? And how are the choices that you're making online look like who you really are? And we live in this world now where frequently we're seeing these polished, beautiful views on social media of how life is. Look at my beautiful meal with 18 vegetables that I cooked and I must take a picture of. I'm guilty. I do it all the time. Or look at these fabulous shoes that I bought. Or look at how happy we all are playing together. And these are, these are ways that we present ourselves online while offline or internally we may be experiencing many different things. 
And so one of the, the questions that we ask is, you know, are these pers these online personas that kids craft healthy? And there are people who will say they are great and that it's good for them and it's a good exploration for them to explore different parts of their personality by building different um, personas online. There are some that say that's really good. And then there are on the other side that say that it's making us more and more superficial. So there's, there's not one particular school of thought. I'd like to say we can find a happy medium and use our online life as a way of expressing and sharing ourselves. Um, and we hope that that we can model that for kids too. Yes, question. You're right. It's the same process that we all went through. The biggest piece that's different is that now it lives online forever. Whereas when I wanted to go through my Seattle phase, I could live that Seattle phase with maybe some pictures that are definitely chopped up into little bits and pieces somewhere. And that when I wanted to go through my this phase, it's it doesn't live for it doesn't have to live forever. So that's the biggest difference. But you're absolutely right in that the way that children build their identity um, and the dramas that they face are similar. They're elevated um, by 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 being online. Um, this generation uh, tends it tends to be a. Um, people that are very heavily influenced by celebritization. Um, they are they are more so than than my generation and and I'm only a few generations removed from this current young youth generation and um, they're very moved by the celebritization of things yet concurrently they're also a very altruistic social justice minded fair play minded generation and then the question becomes are they participating in acts of service and altruism because of their ability to then put it out in the world, look what I've done, or are they doing it from some sense of internal um, wanting to give back? And that becomes the question, and that becomes the place where we, as the adults in their lives, need to offer spaces for self-reflection. So offering those opportunities for them to express their, their desire for social justice and their desire to participate in volunteerism, but also to be mindful of making it less about Look, here's my selfie. Well, I helped, I served the poor, but what did that experience mean to me? So that's also an important part. The last um, piece that I think is really interesting in this about imagination is talks a little bit about a lot about creativity and how what is our new perception of creativity in the world? Kids, um, because they are growing up with, I have an app for this and I have an app for that and I have an app for this their sense of creativity is starting to skew in a way that it didn't for, oh, here's my, here's my pad and pencil of papers, or here's my series of clothes that I can put into a creative outfit, or here's the way I can take these rocks and sticks and build a house. They, they see a different way of participating in creativity, and so it's helping them understand the difference between true creativity um, creating new new apps and building things that then become 3D printed, really digging their hands into actual clay versus, oh, I used this filter on my Instagram. I'm so creative. And so helping them understand the differences between consumption and creation in a technological world is something that is really important to help them build that innate imagination, which is what's going to help them become the problem solvers and the creative thinkers to solve the problems that we don't know exist yet. There's also a lot of question with this generation about narcissism and social anxiety. And there, it's, it's rampant. The social anxiety that um, the rates of stress amongst our teens that is often tied to social media and is often tied to use of the internet. 
And I would argue that it is not, that is just a mere piece of the larger puzzle and that this is a generation that is taught that they need to be happy all the time. They're a generation that's also taught that they shouldn't struggle. And so it's really important for us as the adults in their lives to encourage moments of struggle and to encourage those, those um, times of failure and the times of discomfort away from technology so that they understand that that's, that that's the source of their happiness does not have to be tied to perfection. Um, that, that, that takes a lot more than technology and it takes a whole lot more than their youth, their youth leaders. It's, a, it's, a, it's becoming a systemic issue, particularly if you're from this area um, or other areas of high stress, high intense um, work environments and schooling environments. So let's talk about some things we can do to make this better now that I've gotten kind of sad. And OK, life is really sad on, on the internet. But let's talk about some things we can do. Um, talking about modeling is, I, this is my favorite picture. <laughs> Because I absolutely think modeling is the abs modeling and communicating are on the top of the list because they're the most important things that we can do. Um, I'll tell a brief story. So I wasn't on Instagram until a few years ago when I got um, an email from a former parent of the whose children I had taught at a former school, and she said, "My child wants to join Instagram. Will you be her friend so that she knows?" Someone is watching her. I was like, sure. I do, I do not teach her anymore. She is over 13. Absolutely. And so it became this village of, I'm not going to stalk her. I'm not As the kids like to say, are you stalking me on Facebook? Gosh. I'm not going to stalk her, but I know that um, I'm going to engage in a conversation with her about, is she making good choices? She also knows that if she doesn't make a good choice, that I'm not going to have any qualms on calling her on it. And so the second part of this story is I posted a picture on Instagram and I noticed uh, 9 o'clock in the morning on a school day that she had commented on it. And so my comment back to her was, aren't you in class right now? Her mom was thrilled. So, but it was just one of those things where it becomes that, that, that communication of what is expected, the modeling of what is the best expectation. Um, I think that it's really important for us to set clear clear parameters for our kids and to say this is what our family values, this is what our community values, and we want to use these tools. We want you to get to take pictures. We want you to get to share. We want you to get to text with your friends because those are all important ways that you express yourself and you express your identity. But here's the thing about you're still a kid, you know, that, that we set those parameters very clearly and we can do that. Um, communicating about what is safe. You know, the question of, I don't even know what is safe. Um, you know, the same old rules apply. You don't give out, you don't match your name, your, your full name, and your face. Um, you don't give out your address. You don't post your phone. You make your accounts private. Um, because e they will not be private to the company. So my Instagram account is private to the company, of, is private, to, not private to Instagram, but it is private to people who are not my friends. Helping the kids understand how tagging works. Helping them understand the things that they know how to do. They know how to make put a photo online. They know how to tag it. But do they know what the implications of that are? So having those conversations with them, not to scare them, not to do stranger danger, but to be really honest about this is what happens. Um, and to know that if that's something that your community or your family wants to put limits on, that, that that's OK. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics put some really um, strong language towards limits of screen time, and um, that it's it's become in the last six to eight months really co not controversial, but just kind of wondering where those numbers come from. They say no screen time whatsoever of any device whatsoever for zero to two. Um, and that has to do with brain development. That has to do with children needing to play with blocks, play with sticks, sit quiet, sit by themselves and not do anything. Um, ki my kids often will say, I'm bored. What, what have you tried? What have you done? And they won't 
they won't know how to onboard themselves. And so that zero to two time is a time where they learn that. And then in elementary school age, one to two hours per day being the screen time suggested limit, but in a way that is non-passive, that is active, that is allowing kids to be working on something where they're physically involved in a task, using an art app, playing with Minecraft, um, as opposed to a passive watching. Again, so that they're actively engaging the the pathways in their brain that are still developing. So that's the so if you if you want a piece to take back to your families and your in your congregations, that's a huge piece. Is about screen timing and balance limits. And this comes from a girl who watched so many hours of TV growing up that it's it's amazing that I can put a sentence together. Um, but it it in the end kids will be fine. You know, parents will say to me, I can't do, what about, what about snow days? What about weekends? And I say, well, it's balance. So one day you don't watch any TV, TV at all. And on a snow day, it's Netflix marathon. Why not? And that's, that's okay. You know, in the end, we're talking long-term balance. Um, digital curfews are really important, communicating those with, with, with teenagers in particular. So many of my kids sleep with their phone on their bed, which kind of feels like a fire hazard to me, but also is the blue light that emanates from the screens is bad for their melatonin, bad for their sleep habits, and teenagers need nine to ten hours of sleep a night. None of them get it because they have to be at the school before the rooster wakes up, but they they need that sleep and the quality of sleep matters. So keeping teen, teen devices in particular, um, keeping all devices for young children in public places at all times, but then um, for teenagers, iPads, iPhones, iTouches, whatever, um, phones out of the bedrooms at night, not only because of the, the way that they will be texting each other till 2 in the morning, um, but also because of the actual light itself that will disturb their sleep patterns. And, and making that a kind of just a non-negotiable is really important. Yes? I think they're awesome. I am a big proponent of having a space in um, like the family room or the living room where everybody plugs in their phone at night and um, all your devices are. I am also a strong proponent of not allowing kids to take their laptops into their bedrooms with the door closed. I think that they, at the end of the day, they're still kids and they need to know that we as their adults aren't going to hover over them, but are going to be mindful of, the, of what they're doing. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think I, you hit the nail on the head in terms of grandma. I, I followed you once you got there, but I um, we talk about the village a lot, and it you know the cliche of it's all we're all in this together to raise these children, and that that it's not about me stalking you, and not about me expecting you to mess up. I want you to make good choices. It's not about me setting you up to mess up. It's about me wanting to support you. And so it's got to be in concert with um, conversation. Parents ask me a lot about filtering and about tracking. And I'm not a huge proponent of filtering. Um, because we filter at my, at my school. We do. Um, we filter for pornography and gaming and social media. 
um, because we're a school and there's liability issues. But I think that filtering for the sake of filtering doesn't promote the relationship building between the adult and the child that you're hoping to build, um, to build that, that conversation of what are you doing, why are you doing it. There are, you know, you do want them to have some ability as they grow older, as they, as they, you know, start to explore things and look stuff up online, you know, because the, the, the Google, Google is now the magazine hidden under the pillow. And so, you know, they'll, they will explore some of that. And that's part of their development too. But for them to know that, um, that, that, you are aware of what's going on, that that's a really positive, a positive relationship building piece. I always tell, our, in fifth grade, our students get their laptops that are school issued for the first time. And when I sit down with them and I have, we have the social media chat, we have the how to, you know, how you're behaving chat, I always say, your parents are still your parents. And, and I'm telling them that too. I sit down with the parents and say, you're still the parent. And if you take this device away, that's okay. No is okay. And if Jim's mom down the street doesn't say no, that's okay. You can still say no. And it's hard because there are so many different parenting styles, but there always have been. You know, I could watch R-rated movies at my friend's house, but not at my house. And that's, that's just kind of the way parenting is. Um, but that village piece, the more that it can be engaged, the better. And we have that opportunity as congregations to really open those conversations. Um, the the last two pieces here, the unplugging and the contracts. Um, the unplugging piece is just something that I think is is just a valuable piece for all of us. I have um, a lot of women I admire who are mo moms on Instagram, for example, who will on Friday afternoon post a picture that says, "Have enough analog weekend. See you later." And I think that's something that's really important for all of us to do, not just to encourage our children to do, but to have those media-free times. And for some of us, we can't. You know, we're on call, or we have a sick parent, or we, we need to have that. And again, long-term balance. Um, in my home, we used to do media-free Mondays. And so our phones would get put away, our computers would get put away, and um, we would read books, and we would play games, and we would talk to human beings face to face. And that's OK, too. Our kids are developing the skills of talking to each other face to face. They are developing the skills of talking to adults. They do still need that practice, just like we did, of learning how to appropriately have conversations with adults. They are still doing that. The technology isn't interfering with that in the way that we want to think it is. They just are adding a language of how do they communicate via technology. Um, and then the contracts piece is huge. I encourage this to every parent um, I work with. It's, it's not that um, different than the contracts that you may have seen um, in high school about um, family decisions about drinking or, or drug use or that kind of thing. Um, it's basically a, a, a agreement between you and your children or your or your group that says this is what we believe about using technology. These are what we're going to agree to. And this is the way it is. Um, they, they're really just a very visual way. And they're a great conversation starter, particularly when you start with young children. When you start the, f you know, the first time, when your child's five, here's our agreement about TV. And here's our agreement about phone, you know, or even younger. You know, no, I'm not going to hand you my phone when we're at a restaurant. You know, here's some crayons. It's good for their fine motor skills anyway. You know, that's what, that's, and making those agreements and making them public, posting them on the fridge, you know, put, putting them in a place where we know, and making them agreements for us as the adults, too. I agree that when I go to your soccer game, I will take pictures with my phone, but I will not be texting or Facebooking or whatever it is that I'm doing that distracts me from watching you be an awesome soccer player. Um, I, yes, ma'am. No, you're fine. Yes, I do, and all of this is available on the website that I that I have for you. That um, I, they're actually not even my samples; they're Common Sense Media, which is an incredible organization, and they have um, digital family contracts based on age level, which are great. And so they're just templates, jumping off points. They might not work for each individual family, but they are quite spectacular, and they have them in English and in Spanish.
which is just a nice, a nice piece. So all of this wraps up to why we're here, the E formation, and how we can use these tools for good um, in an environment of, of Christian formation. And I, would, I want to hear more about your digital formation curriculum later, because that's something that's really interesting. Um, but I, I think that there are just some tools and some things you can consider. Um, as I was saying earlier, kind of being a friend and not a lurker, not a friend like, we are buddy buddies. You're still the adult. I'm still the you're I'm still the adult. You're still the child. But recognizing that by making those relationships, they know they have you as an outlet. They know they have you as a an, a line. An example one of my students gave was, my mom sees all of my group texts because of the way the account works, and so she knows that. So I know I can say I can't be in this text anymore because my mom's watching. Kids like to have that. They like. They might tell you they don't, but they want to have that boundary available to them. They don't want you to be a lurker. They don't want you to comment on their pages, but they do want you to. to they want to know that you're there. Um, it's a protection piece. That when you're working with kids, um, particularly teenagers, if you do youth work, if images are the key. If you can give kids the ownership to, to using images to document their experience, it can really provide a great jumping off point for self-reflection. Um, we were talking in the first session about using um, a blog, using a blog and using photos to capture mission trips and having the students be the ones who are doing that piece, that they're the ones who want, oh, it's my day, I'm, it's my blog day, so I'm going to go in today, and at the end of the day, I'm going to write my experience that I had today, and I'm going to show this picture, and then that can get shared with my community, and so they can see the work that we're doing, and the kids have that beautiful record of what they've done. It's a really powerful experience for them, and it's a way that they can do that, and engage, and also a way for their parents to relax some anxiety if their babies are away on a trip as well. Um, remind, remind used to be called Remind 101, it's now just called Remind, is a great way to um, be able to communicate with a group without having to give out your cell phone number. It allows you to provide a link to um, either kids or parents that then you can text and say, Here's what I'm doing. Here's here's where we are. I've used it with my teams, my sport, my running teams. Yes, remind, like remind me, remind.com, um, and it it allows me then to say, hey, track meet finished, getting on the George Washington Bridge, you know, and then or getting on the Parkway, and then they can see what are our updates, and then it protects both sides. I don't see their phone number. They don't see mine but it allows us to communicate back and forth. So it, it does connect through text, but it uses a an app that connects through or a website that connects through and will send them messages. Just remind. Yep. And it's on the it's on the it's on the piece that I'm gonna make sure you have a copy of as well. Um, it's a, well it's on the um, it's on the app list. Um, on the website. This website, by the way, actually, I should have been saying that the whole time. Everything I'm talking about is right here on this website. Um, and forgive me for not saying that 40 minutes ago. <laughs> um, and it's just very, it's a nice way to get to, if you're working with teenagers, since text is their medium, if they have, they, they don't have to be in the Remind app, they just have to sign up through that app. And it gives, sends them a text message saying, hey, remember, tomorrow we're all bringing you know, um, gift cards to Sunday school, or we're all wearing purple, or we're meeting at 7 a.m. to get on the bus to go hiking. Those are all just little things that can allow you to communicate on their terms. Um, my students do not like email. They don't respond to email. They just don't. It's just not their thing. And so instead of hitting our heads against the wall trying to get them to read their email, let's speak their language. And this is super easy and you just sign it up sign up there's a code they sign up done um, and all and all of the parents on my on my team signed up this past year um, the piece that becomes a little tricky with some of our formation is if you're working with middle schoolers so if they're 11 to 13 or 10 to 13 10 to 12 they don't fit within the copa the the um, 
they don't fall under the protections of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So I do not encourage them to use the social media pieces. However, I do still encourage them to use things like the phone, um, the taking, using, taking pictures, I think that's great. Um, and then also some of these apps like Remind are child friendly. They do fall within the, the appropriate age levels. So that makes it okay. Um, creating a hashtag for your for your group for your event it's just a nice way to curate your information so then if you've got if you are um, if your kids are tweeting if your kids are doing Instagram then they can create um, a whole thread of the things that you've been doing on whatever activity you're doing it just allows them a way to use the language they know to share the, ex the positive experiences they have with groups and with friends um, and in a very public way. Um, this list is also this on the um, on the website or on the website, but I'm going to point out two books that I think are just spectacular for all adults who love small humans to read. And one is The Big Disconnect by Katherine Steiner Adair. It is a great book that talks about the changing role of families in the digital age and the way that family dynamics have changed and what are the um, social emotional ramifications of that. She, it's an outstanding book um, just, to, just to get some thought about um, why, we, why we want to limit things for our kids and experiences. She's very active in the commercial free childhood movement. Um, which we haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time talking about, but just the way that kids are marketed to um, and, and it's kind of mind-blowing at times. So it's a really lovely read. And then I Rules by Janelle Burley Hoffman is, is a lighter read and very accessible. She is a parent of five children, bless her, and she's my age. Um, so, which is staggering to me. She's amazing. She's in, she's funny, and she, when her oldest son turned 13, you may have seen it. It went viral all over the interwebs um, of the I rules, the rules that she made up for him when he got his first phone. And they are thoughtful. They are in. They're clear, and they're funny, and they're loving. Um, and they, she wrote a whole book about it. And so, and, and she gives the experience of both she and her husband and each of the way they approach their media lives with their, each of their different children at their different ages when the book was written. So everything from little tiny person to 14. And I think that's a really thoughtful way of, of engaging in that. So on the website that, on this website here, these are all um, hyperlinked so you can just click on them and it'll take you to places. I'm um, just a funny, if you ever want a, a funny app that's interesting, it's not fun, meant to be funny, but it can be funny. Terms of service didn't read. I know that I click the button for, yeah, I read that, sure, sign me up all the time. And you can install terms of service didn't read as a little app on Google Chrome. And, and when you go to a website that has a sign in, it'll pop up and tell you, mm, here's what you might need to be thinking about in terms of privacy, in terms of you know, what data they're collecting, which is just interesting. And sometimes and sometimes the reviews are funny. Um, so I, now we have, I think, about 15 minutes. Um, I want to make sure that I've answered all of your questions. I can't believe I've actually stood still this whole time. It's pretty amazing. So if you have questions um, about anything I've talked about, something I haven't talked about, yes, please. Mm -hmm. So as that becomes an option for folks, there is, there is a need for balance, there's a need for safety yes. for young people, and it gives them the tools that they need to make the decisions to make good decisions for adults. Um, there are a bunch of adults who aren't paying attention to that. Um, and then also there are a bunch of young people who get exposed to tools that they didn't know they stepped in their whole life. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. 
Sure. I have never been asked the question about VR. So that's cool. You win, and I hope you feel better soon. So summarize, summarize really quickly. OK, so um, really quickly, Common Sense Media, um, keep talking and still live a human life. Like, I, they, they, there just has to be balance. Um, I think that there is some really neat things that you can do with virtual reality in terms of exploring places. I see, for, as an educator, I see it as a really neat place to explore places we can't normally go. Um, but I really am wary about a fully online virtual life, if that makes sense. Um, but the, in terms of the resources, some of the ones that are up there, we'll talk kind of more about the ethical ramifications of VR. Yeah. Other questions, thoughts, concerns? Yes. Um, what I mentioned in the beginning, I have a professor who is just completely opposed to screens of any sort. I think he's in here, so I would say he's six. Mm -hmm. um, and if I want to use a screen in the car, family will choose to forget the words of science. Mm -hmm. And um, we were talking about that in the car. Absolutely. Anything like that, and um, my brother said that he was absolutely fine with mm -hmm. using it. So, um, any suggestions for sure. how to help them think about that as a tool that would also kind of work? Sure. They're always going to be far outliers. They're going to be the ones that let their families do willy-nilly on the internet, and they're going to be the ones that say absolutely never, ever again. Um, if he's six and they're projecting, and he hasn't seen projections at school yet, it's coming, so that'll be interesting for them to explore as well. But I think that you can offer them the option of printing off a couple of pages of song lyrics, but in the long term, you have to think about your whole congregation. And if that's what's right for your congregation, is because that's so important that they can see it, they can see it big, and they can participate so that our children can actively worship together with their families, then you must, must move forward. Um, helping them see that limited use that's non-passive, which is what this is, is is okay. And that it's um, you're not asking him to become um, a vidiot. As for, for to use that term, you know, we don't want we. It's he's not his brain is not going to turn to mush, in when he is actively participating in what's on the screen. So I think that's really important for them to understand, especially in the limited time of one hour on a Sunday. Yes, ma'am. Sure, sure. Um, so I do not, and this is also policy at most schools, I do not um, friend or participate in online activities with students that I am currently teaching. Um, how that works in a youth space is very different. But the other piece about my online life is my on, I want my online life to reflect my offline life. So when I post things online, if I don't want my middle schoolers to know I'm doing it, I won't post it. I mean, because that's me making making a responsible choice as an adult as well. Um, you know, and so if they see pictures of me with a glass of wine in my hand, that's okay. I'm 36 years old. I'm allowed to have a glass of wine in my hand. And so, you know, that's a piece that it, I'm modeling responsibility. Um, I'm modeling my passion for justice and my passion for learning and my passion for um communicating about peace. Those are all things that I am okay with them seeing and being a part of. Um, there are people that will build separate accounts that then connect to their students here and there. I mean, that's fine. That's a workaround. But I think for me as the adult, if I'm going to model appropriate behavior, then I want to model it for whomever's going to see it. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts or questions? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. So I want to leave you with just a little bit of humor. I'll let you read it. So at the end of the day, I must thank my friend Chrissy, who makes beautiful, funny graphics like this. But at the end of the day, it, it's about balance. It's about good intentions. And if you have those two things in your head, then, then you're going to make 
good choices and you're going to help them do it too. So all of this is available on this website here and including I'll update the slides um, later tonight so that to make sure it's the most recent copy of the of the presentation. There's a whole contact list for me at, on the page too. Please feel free to email me call, whatever you might need, um, if I can be of service to you or your congregations, I'm so happy to do it. Thank you.